So the anointing of God or the power of God functioning in our everyday lives is absolutely crucial for us to fulfill the plans which God has for us. Even before you were born, God had plans already for each and every one of you sitting here today. Jeremiah 1 verse 5, the New Living Translation says, Even before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Wow. Even before God formed you in the womb, He knew you. You knew God and He knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Apart from the anointing of God, you will never be able to accomplish what the Lord has planned for you to do. And if you need the anointing, which is the empowerment of God, to do whatever it is that He has called you to do, it is more important to pursue the anointing of God rather than the calling. Your calling can be identified through whatever abilities you might have, whatever passions you might have, and whatever talents that you might have. But this can only be found in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when I was not serving the Lord, my passions and my desires and my gifts were like different. Amen? And your talents or your calling can only function when it becomes a gift. Are you with me? When you look at the band and you see how they sing and you see how they perform, I've been teaching them from day one, and they'll tell you, not about their talent, but about the anointing. A talent can get you so far, but when it becomes a gift, when the anointing comes on that which the Lord has imparted in you to do, only then does it become a gift, and only then can it be used for the kingdom of God. So your talents and your, your calling and, and whatever it is, and the, the, the callings on people's life, it ranges right the way through this could be someone that, that, I mean, the Bible talks about gifts of administration. Amen? Gifts of prophecy, gifts of teaching, gifts of giving. Amen? So the, so the, the, the gifts are diverse and it's like a, an entire body. And if you are diligent in your gift, whether that be looking after the cars outside and you are diligent in that as unto the Lord, you will receive the same reward as the pastor, the preacher, the prophet. Amen. Amen. But it has to be done connected to the anointing. Now, the talents that you have, if God knew you before you were formed in the womb, and he set you apart for him, for his kingdom, and he has called you, some to be a prophet, some to be, it, it's all a gift. You are nothing more than a steward of your talents. Whatever it is that you are good at, that you are nothing more than a steward. You are nothing more than a manager of something which God has put inside of you for you to be set apart for his kingdom. And every one of your talents, every one of your abilities, one day you will have to give an account to the one who entrusted you with those talents on how you used it. Can you imagine if someone had a family, stayed in a home, 
a nice home and had a large family of people that, that uh, uh, children, maybe adopted kids, and, and there was a whole bunch of people that was living in this house of this person. And then this person went away on a long trip and then entrusted a trustee with certain responsibilities, with certain uh, authority, with certain finances, and gave that responsibility to the trustee to take care of his household, his kingdom. And that trustee squandered it all on themselves, just looked after themselves, used that to build their own house, to look after themselves, and not take care of the master's business. How do you think that master will treat that servant when he comes back? Do you know that the scripture says that when the master comes back and he finds the servant doing that which he should do, which is feeding his children, good for that servant. But if he comes back and he finds that servant not doing what he should be doing, the scripture says that he will cut him into pieces. Amen? So we need to understand and we need to take very seriously this fact that the moment that you are born again and you are saved from an eternity in hell, you become part of a kingdom. And when you become part of this kingdom, you have a crucial role to play. Every single one of you, according to your ability. You need to understand when you call yourself a Christian and you become born again, you have lost ownership of you. You don't belong to you anymore. You have been bought. You have been rescued. You come under the ownership of the one that bought you. You do not have the right or the privilege to make your own decisions. You don't have the right or the privilege to live how you want to live. You do not belong to you. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, you're living translation. Don't you realize, don't you get it? Christians, don't you understand this? Are you so deceived that you do not realize and grasp this fact that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, who was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. You and I were destined for an eternity in hell. We were rescued. It's like we were, we were like cattle in an abattoir. I'm sorry for being graphic, but I don't know how to get this point across to you. And there was only one way out, and that was death and someone came and literally bought you out of this and now owns you and the scripture says Matthew 20 verse 28 that the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom as a payment Paying the price to set you free from the penalty of sin. Wow. Jesus paid for you. He bought you with his, he paid for you with his love. And when you receive salvation, you agree. You agree to exchange your life from an eternity in heaven to a life of service and gratitude to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord didn't lay down His life and buy you and pull you out of an eternity in hell so that you can just live your life. 
Do what you want to do. Treat your body how you want to treat it. Using your talents, your abilities, your influence, all for yourself. You should fear the day that you will face the Lord God. Amen? We cannot downplay the eternity in hell that we would have faced if we were not bought. You can't downplay that. You can't downplay the eternity in hell that you would have faced. You can't downplay that. And you can't downplay the price that Jesus Christ paid for you with His very own life. And when you choose Jesus, when you choose to be bought by Him, you exchange hell with service to the Lord. We have to take responsibility and accountability for this, not a burden, but a great gift. Child of God, what, and what you need to do in life and what God has called you to do, you need the anointing. You need the anointing. You need the empowerment of God. You have a huge responsibility to do what God has called you to do, but you have an even greater responsibility to achieve the anointing so that you can do what you have to do. If you try to do what you think God has called you to do, whatever it may be, and you try to do it apart from the anointing, you failed even before you started. Many people have callings on their lives, whether that is in business, whether that is in helping children, whatever it is, many people have callings in their life, and they know, and they, and they, and they, and they, and they sense this calling, and they, they pursue the calling, even those in ministry, and they pursue the calling. And if you pursue the calling, apart from the anointing, you can be used by the devil. The enemy will hijack your talent, and you will get a devilish gift. And you can be doing good things. You can be taking care of the children. You can be uh, 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 working in ministry. You can be working in business, thinking you're doing everything for the Lord. But if you're not connected to the anointing of God, you can be used by the devil. Matthew 7 verse 22, on judgment day, many... Do you know that word many is the Greek word pluros? Do you know that that means the majority? On judgment day, the majority who say to me, Lord, Lord, the majority of the Christians, the majority of those people on judgment day who say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, Lord. We cast out demons in your name. We performed many miracles in your name. We were functioning in the gifts, functioning in ministry. Lord, we know you, Lord. It's all done in your name. And plainly I say, I never knew you, you workers of inequity. You evil doer. But Lord, I cast out demons. Evil. I prophesied, Lord, evil. I performed many miracles, evil. Why? Because you did not know me. You were hijacked. You have no right. The Lord says, everything you have, every gift, every talent, every ability, every influence is God's glory, manifest gift inside of you. He will not share His glory with anyone or anything. It's all for His kingdom. 
It's all for his kingdom. Whatever you have, whatever giftings and abilities you have, he will not, that's his glory. He's imparted it into, his, into your life. He will not share his glory. So you can think you're doing good things. You can be pursuing your calling. You can be performing miracles. And all the while, these are demons working through you. People might say, well, Pastor Carl, how can that work? Kingdom divided can't stand. How can demons cast out demons? How can demons heal the sick? It's match fixing. Hello. Do you know what match fixing is? You might have two boxes in a ring. They look like they're opposition. They're fighting against each other, but they're working together. Hello? What brought the sickness? Demons. So they, they, they work together. When you see demons cast out, that's just manifestations. When people are prophesying, that's just divination. Wake up, people. Apart from the anointing, you will fail every single time, even though you think that you are doing what the Lord has called you to do. And the key is this, the Lord said to them, I never knew you. But they knew him. They knew him, but he never knew them. You see, the anointing is developed and it is nurtured and it is cultivated by spending time in the presence of Jesus. There is no other way. And your number one priority, your number one priority is for you to pursue the Lord. to develop this relationship with him, to pursue this intimacy with him. That is your number one priority. That's your starting point. John 1 verse 3, God created everything through him, through Jesus. Everything, everything, the seen, the unseen, the galaxies, the planets, Everything was created through Jesus and nothing was created unless through Christ. Colossians 1 verse 16, all things were created through Him and for Him. God created everything, all of existence, so that He could create family. He created this world and this nature and, 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 and the atmosphere and, and everything. He created all of that so he could create his children. You. For him. For him. You are the center of his world. Can you imagine the value of the life of Jesus? Can you imagine the value of the life of Jesus if everything was created through him? His value is everything and more. And he created you for himself and when he lost you, He paid the price of all creation for you to get you back to Him for Himself, the loving parent that loves their child so much that literally gives up their life for their child, and he done that for you. What price did he pay for us? And the very purpose that you have in life 
is that relationship with Him. Before you do what you think you're assigned to do, it is the relationship, it is the anointing that will carry you through to do what you need to do. That's what, it will, that's what will empower you. And that's what you need to always stay connected to. The minute you, you lose that, that intimacy, that connection, that source of very life, of everything that you need to do, the minute you separate from that and you start to do things for God, you become an evildoer. And that's when you see so many ministries fail. So many great men and women of God fail. They're so too busy doing ministry, so too busy doing the things of God, and they've lost the very source of what should be empowering them to do that. Your life mission is to discover who Jesus is. Your life mission is to understand what grieves Jesus. That's your life mission. You need to know what grieves Him. You need to know in the Scriptures, Lord, what, it, what is it that grieves you, Lord? Your heart should break at the very thought of doing any of it. Your life mission is to know and understand what pleases Him. And you should be completely and totally consumed by the desire to do so. It is your life mission. It is your life purpose. It is your greatest calling. I am obsessed by this man called Jesus. All I want to do is please him. All I want to do is serve him. The last thing I want to do on this planet is to grieve him. And the more that I, I, I pursue him, the more that I, I, I cry out, the more I, I just lay my life down, the more I just am desperate for him, the more I find myself. The more I find peace, the more I find fulfillment, the more I find joy, because I'm doing that which He's called me to do. You can, you can use your talents and you can, you can think that, you know, oh, I just want to have this business and I just want to have this house and I just want this fame and I just want this. And you might even get there and you might even su succeed. And you will get there and you'll be as miserable and depressed and empty and even more so because there's nothing that can satisfy. Nothing. Then that intimate personal relationship with Jesus and the absolute surrender of everything that you are to Him. When God created you, he had in mind to set you apart. He had in mind when He created you. He had in mind you. He had in mind the relationship that He wanted to have with you. He had in mind the, the obedience that he, he, he wanted from you. He had in mind these plans for you. He had in mind these, these dreams and these hopes for you like any parent would. And everything that He has planned for you, His hopes and His dreams for you, is limitlessly beyond anything you could ever think that you could do on your own apart from Him. The Scripture says, Romans 8 verse 32, He who did not spare His Son, but gave Him up for us all, for you and me, how... <laughs> How will he not also, along with Christ, along with the value of Christ, graciously give you all things to the value of Christ? He 
He values you so much. He paid for you with such a valuable price. And He wants to lavish upon you all things according to the value of Christ. Think about that. That's what He wants for you. That's the Word of God along with Christ, along with the value of Christ. All things, substance, things, anything to the value of Christ He wants to give to you. So what is the problem? What is the problem? Why are we not seeing this? Why do we not experience this? Why do we not see all of these wonderful blessings that God has planned for us? Because we know that He's already made it available to us. So obviously the problem's not on His side. The problem lies with us. Because we are so spiritually immature that if the Lord had to pour out His blessings upon us, we would just squander it. We would drift from Him. We would spend it on things that we shouldn't that could destroy us. We would become more greedy. We would become more selfish. It's like if you can imagine a very wealthy man that died and he left an inheritance for children. But now these children... The wealth belongs to them, but they cannot access the wealth because they're still too immature. And so there are trustees that are appointed over the wealth that will distribute it to the children until they reach the age of maturity and then they access it. Galatians 4 verse 1. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children... And those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up. Do you think God will trust you with wealth if you still cannot tithe? Do you know that Scripture says that if you hate your brother, you're a murderer? Do you think He's going to bless a murderer? Do you know the scripture says that if you do not forgive others, God cannot forgive you? Do you think He can bless you if you have unforgiveness? And all of that comes through relationship with Jesus. Lord, what pleases you? What displeases you? Lord, show me. Help me. Help me to serve you. Help me to please you. All comes through the anointing. Don't ever be, be deceived, child of God. Apart from the Lord, you have no good thing. You know the Bible says that your heart is wicked above all things? You know that? The heart is wicked. We have such evil thoughts, such judgmental thoughts, such critical thoughts, such evil thoughts. Our hearts are wicked. The Bible says that you're not free to do the good things you want to do because you have an evil, sinful nature. The only good thing that you have in you is the Lord Jesus Christ. Apart from Him, you have no good thing. And if you don't have Him, you have no good thing. Psalm 16, verse 2, NIV, I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have, I have no good thing. Apart from the Lord, child of God, you have no good thing. And the anointing is the process of the infilling. It's the process of the infusing and the infilling of the very essence of God. And when you yield your life to this essence of God, you start to experience the glory of God in your life. And the glory of God is the goodness of God. Exodus 33 verse 18. And he said, please show me your glory. 
Then the Lord said, I will make my goodness pass before you. The glory of God, when you see the glory of God, it is the goodness of God. When you see the Lord healing someone, delivering someone, meeting their needs, taking care of them, that is all the goodness of God. The anointing, the glory, the goodness comes from the presence of God. It comes from knowing Him. And the fruition, the maturity, the, 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 res, the achieving the anointing, it's a process of exchange. It's not a withdrawal. You don't go to receive the anointing. It's not how it works. You don't pursue power. The anointing comes through exchange. It comes through giving yourself to the Lord. It comes through yielding to the Lord. It comes through a life of, of worship. It comes through a life of, of sacrificial giving of yourself to the Lord. It's in that place where you, where you, where you fall to your knees and you, and you say, Lord, search me, Lord. Help me, Lord. And it is in this process of when you are giving of yourself to the Lord that the Lord gives of Himself to you. You never seek power when you seek the anointing. You seek the face of God. Amen? Romans 12 verse 1, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, to give your bodies to God because of all that He has done for you. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind that He will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. You worship God through making your life a living sacrifice. You begin to sacrifice the things that you want to do, that you know that you shouldn't be doing. You sacrifice it as a form of worship. And even the things that you know that you should be doing and you shouldn't, you do it as a sacrificial offering to the Lord. Your life becomes a state of worship, a state of sacrifice. You sacrifice time to spend with the Lord. And then what you do in secret, in the secret place with the Lord, the Lord will publicly display as the anointing in your life. Matthew 6 verse 4, New King James Version. That your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. The anointing of God reveals publicly the depths of what you are doing secretly. Amen. In Scripture, God was going to make an appearance to the Israelites when Moses was going to get the commandments of God. And it's a, it's a long story, but I'm going to summarize it for you so that you can understand the ways of God and the journey of discovery to Him. So we read from Exodus 19, verse 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down and prepare the people for my arrival. Prepare the people. How, Lord? Consecrate them today and tomorrow. Make them holy. Purify them. Cleanse them. Have them even wash their clothing. Be sure that they are ready for me on the third day, for that day the Lord down will, will, will come down on Mount Sinai as all the people watch. But mark off a boundary around the mountain. Warn the people, be careful. Do not go up the mountain. Don't even touch its boundaries. Anyone who touches the mountain will certainly be put to death. No hand may touch the person or animal that crosses the boundary. Instead, stone them or shoot them with arrows. They must be put to death. However, when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, 
Then the people may go up on the mountain. So Moses went down to the people. He consecrated them for worship. And they washed their clothes. And he told them, get ready for the third day. Until then, even abstain from all sexual intercourse. Verse 21, then the Lord told Moses, go back down and warn the people not to break through the boundaries to see the Lord or they will die. Even those priests who regularly come near to the Lord, they must purify themselves so that the Lord does not break out and destroy them. But Lord, Moses protested, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai. You already warned us. You told me, mark off a boundary all around the mountain to set it apart as holy. Verse 24. Then the Lord instructed Moses, come up here to me. Bring along Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 of Israel's elders. All of you must worship from a distance. Only Moses is allowed to come near to the Lord. All others must not come near, and none of the people are allowed to climb up the mountain with Moses. Exodus 24, verse 9, the New Living Translation. Then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel climbed up the mountain. And there they saw the God of Israel. And underneath his feet, there seemed to be a, a surface of a brilliant blue lapis lazuli, as clear as the sky itself. And though these nobles of Israel gazed upon God, he did not destroy, destroy them. In fact, they ate a covenant meal. They ate and drank the table of his presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay there. And I will give you the tablets of stone, which I've inscribed the instructions and commands so you can teach the people. So Moses and his assistant Joshua set out. And Moses climbed higher up the mountain of God. Moses told the elders, stay here and wait for us until we come back. Aaron and her will remain here with you. If anyone has a dispute while I'm gone, consult with them. Then Moses climbed up the mountain. And the cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord settled down on Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, the Lord said, Moses, you are ready. Come up. To the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, the glory of the Lord appeared like a summit of consuming fire. Then Moses disappeared in the cloud. As he climbed higher up the mountain, and he remained on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Aaron, come on Aaron. Come on Aaron, our priest. Come on, make, make, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what's happened to, to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said... Take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and the sons of your daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from the ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold and melted it down and molded it into the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O oh Israel, these are the gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron saw how excited all the people were. So he built an altar in front of the calf. And then he announced, tomorrow we will be, uh, have a festival to the Lord. People got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings to this calf. And after this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking and they indulged in pagan revelry. And while I was praying, the Lord started to just unwrap this whole story, the symbolic meaning of all of this. Where the Israelites were the covenant children of God. They were the covenant children of God. 
And these covenant children of God represent Christians. And before they had to come into the very presence of God for three days, they had to purify themselves, they had to consecrate themselves, they had to make themselves holy to come into the presence of a holy God. Even washing their clothes. And that was just to stand at the foot of the mountain. And then at the foot of the mountain there were boundaries put because the mountain of God was holy. When you crossed over that, you were in holy ground. And only the priests who lived consecrated lives, who came regularly before the Lord, only those were the ones that were able to pass by the boundaries. And even those who passed by the boundaries, the Lord said in Exodus 19.22, even those priests who regularly come near to the Lord must purify themselves so that the Lord does not break out and dis destroy them. So as they ascended higher and higher into the presence of God, they had to purify themselves. The boundaries set up separated the holy from the unholy. Even though the Israelites were covenant children, they set up boundaries for themselves. They set boundaries for their sin. They set boundaries for their holy living. You can say it's like the Christian that says, you know what? Uh, there, there's boundaries on my faith. I'll go to church once a week. But I'm not going to do Bible college. You know, like I'll pray, I'll do a devotional once a morning, but I'm not going to read my Bible every day. I have boundaries. Because I, I, I still want to live in sin. I, I still want to watch the things I shouldn't. I still want to do the things I shouldn't. I'm not willing to cross that boundary. The boundaries that I've put up. And those who crossed over the boundaries, cr put the boundaries on sin. They crossed over into holiness and they, they said, this is the boundary. I'm all in for the Lord. And they crossed over. There was no boundaries for them on living a holy life. There were boundaries on sin. And the wonderful thing is, only those who stepped across those boundaries, who said, Lord, I'm all in. I want holiness. I want to ascend the mountain. I want to step out of behind the boundaries of sin. I want to step out of the boundaries that I put in my life, in how I want to serve you. I'm done with this. I'm stepping onto the holy mountain, Lord. The boundaries are now behind me. The boundaries is sin. And it was only those who sat and ate at the table of the Lord's goodness. It was only those who gazed upon the Lord. It was only those who came into the presence and the Lord set a table for them and they ate of the goodness of the Lord. Child of God, if you are still having boundaries on how you want to serve the Lord, if you still have boundaries on the sin that you want to entertain in your life, you, he's not your God. You are still your own God. Because every true Christian knows that they do not belong to themselves. And when you cross over, when you say, Lord, that's it for me. I'm pursuing holiness. I'm putting this sin behind me. Yes, I'm going to fail, Lord. I, I, I'm going to fail, but you know what? I'm not going to live in it. I'm going to ascend. I'm, I'm, I'm going to climb up this mountain. I don't know how many of you have climbed a mountain before. It's not easy. It's symbolic. Climbing up the mountain, pursuing, climbing. It's tough. It's hard. But it's worth it. And then when you put this behind you, when you're all in for Jesus, when you can be the ones that now sit at the table, then you experience, like the Lord said in John 10 verse 10, I came that they may have and enjoy life 
Have it in abundance. Have it till the full. Have it till it overflows. Sit and eat at the table in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. Who wouldn't want that? It is only through a life dedicated of being set apart, pursuing Him, relentlessly pursuing holiness, pursuing sanctification, not tolerating sin, not compromising. That's when you experience the rewards. As Scripture says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, He is a reward of those who diligently, not just once a week, once a month at church, and you're crying, Lord, where are you? The Lord's like, where are you? Lord, 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 I know you. I don't know you. Where are you? You're supposed to be sitting in my presence. You're supposed to be ascending the mountain. You're supposed to be uh, getting rid of those things. You can't stay there. There's boundaries. You can't come here. You must sanctify yourself. Consecrate yourself. Before you were born, He set you apart. Be set apart. Jeremiah 29 verse 13. You will seek me. You will ascend the mountain. And you will find me. When you search for me with all your heart. Are you searching the Lord with all your heart? Are you? And your heart is the very center of your being. It is, it is the epicenter of who you are and everything else flows from that. So you seek the Lord with your heart. You seek the Lord with, with, with your, even with your thoughts, with, with, with what you say, with, with what you do, where you go. Diligently. If there's an opportunity to do a discipleship course, I'm there. If there's Bible college, I'm there. If there's church on Sunday, I'm there. If there's a prayer group on any day, I'm there. I want to sit at the table of the Lord. He has made available to you everything to the value of Jesus Christ. It's at the table of holiness. It's at the table of purity. It's at the table of set apart. Will you ascend the mountain of the Lord? Colossians 3 verse 17. Whatever you do, Whatever you do, whatever you do, no matter what it is, listen, what you are saying or what you are doing, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and independence upon Him, giving thanks to God, the Father through Him. Hallelujah. And what's so interesting as well, is as Aaron, who was the high priest, the high priest, the high priest, Moses' right-hand man, Aaron, as soon as he started to move away from the presence of God, as soon as he crossed over the boundaries now, and he started to compromise, and uh, uh, no longer is he, is he close to the presence, he's moved further away now. He's crossed over the boundaries. Now he's amongst all of the people. And they start to influence him. And they start to manipulate him. And he, the high priest, who saw the sea split, saw all the plagues. Now they go into satanic worship. Do you know that pagan revelry means that we're in, just children, close your ears, if there are any. That was sexual orgies. That was 100% satanic worship. How could this be? How could this be? 
And I think that's a valuable lesson for us. You need to put some boundaries on your life. You really do. You need to put some boundaries on the places that you go. It's going to corrupt you. You'll think you're all Christian, but you're not. You've got to put some boundaries on the people that you hang out with, who, 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 who influence you. They'll corrupt you. If a high priest could get corrupted, they'll corrupt you. You need to put some boundaries in your life. Because as soon as people get disconnected from the presence, the further they move away from the presence, the further they move into worshipping false gods, even thinking that they're doing the right thing. How could he be so deceived? How could they be so deceived? The scripture says, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 11, the Amplified, I've written to you now, Christians, not to associate with any so-called Christians. If you're sexually immoral, Or greedy. Or as an adulterer devoted to anything that takes the place of God. Who has got a foul mouth. Who slanders and abuses people. Speaks behind their backs. Who is a drunk. Or a thief. Have nothing to do with these so-called Christians. Don't even eat with them. Wow. Wow. Food for thought. Amen. If the shoe fits, kick it off. Amen. Now we're going to come to a close. I want you to just listen. Let's just say this, say, Lord, open my eyes that I may see, comprehend, the marvelous mysteries of your beautiful word. I pray that every day. Exodus 33 verse 12. You have said, I know you by name. This is the, 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 the dialogue with Moses as he came to the Lord. You have said, I know you by name. Lord, you have said that you know me by name. You know me in a certain way. You also said that that. You, you found grace in your sight. You're looking at me in a certain way. Now, Lord, therefore I pray, if this is true, if I found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may also find this grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, Lord, if your presence does not go with us, I don't want to even go from this place. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except that you go with us because it's your presence that separates us from all of those people on the earth so the very mission of Moses the very goal of Moses <laughs> was to find the presence of God when he came into the presence of God when he ascended the mountain finally to come into the presence of God he said Lord now that I am in your presence your presence must go with me I do not want to go nowhere without your presence Lord because it's your presence that sets us apart Lord it's your very presence that makes me different and you know Moses wasn't perfect he had serious anger issues he was a murderer so we don't have to be perfect but it's the presence of God that changes us that makes us different we speak different we act different we function different. But what is so interesting to me, what blew me away, 
is that part in Exodus 33 verse 12? He said, you have said, Lord. Lord, you have said, I know you by name. And you have said, Lord, that I found grace in your sight. Now, Lord, I, I pray that if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I might find grace in your sight. See, the Lord was saying, Moses, I know you, Moses. I know you, Moses. I know you by name. I know you by the person I've set you apart to be. I know you, Moses, in a way that I've created you. When I look at you, Moses, I, I see a grace on your life. When I look at you, Moses, I see the relationship that I designed you to have with me. When I look at you, Moses, I see the obedience that I wanted from you. When I look at you, Moses, I see the plans I have for you. It's because I know you, Moses, the real you. When I look at you, Moses, I see the real you. And Moses responds, he said, Lord, I pray. Then I pray, Lord, if you see me this way, then show me your ways that I too may know you. That I too may have this intimate personal relationship with you. That I too may have this, this obedience. Lord, I pray that what you see with a grace in your sight when you look at me, if I have that, then I pray, show me your ways that I may find that, that I may find this grace, that I may find this relationship, that I may find this closeness, that I may find this obedience. And when the Lord created you, He created you in mind for Himself. He pictured this relationship, this, this friendship, this personal relationship. He, he, he created you for that. When He looks at you, He, he, he sees this intimate way that, that, that He created to know you. When He looks at you, He, he sees the person that he, he set you apart to be and the, and the obedience that He wanted from you. When, when he looks at you, he, he sees the plans that he has for you that he so desperately wants to give you. And the only way that we can meet the Lord in these areas is if we, if we want that too. When we are just so captivated by His presence that, that, that we just undone, but we just want to be, Lord, I want that too, Lord. I want that too, Lord. The relationship that you see me, that you wanted from me, I want that too, Lord. I pray for that. Show me the way to get there, Lord. Lord, the obedience that you require from me, I want that too, Lord. I want that too, Lord. I pray, Lord, show me the way. Show me the way. Show me your ways that I can walk in it. The plans, Lord, that you have for me, I want that too, Lord. I want that too, Lord. Show me the way. That I may walk in it, Lord. The way that you see that you know me by name. <laughs> I want that too, Lord, with all my heart. <laughs> with all my heart, with all my being. 
with everything that is in me, Lord. I want to know you, Lord. I want to be that person, Lord. I want to be the one you've created me to be. I want to be obedient to you. I want to serve you. I want to know you, Lord, like you want to know me, Lord. Show me your ways, Lord. Show me your ways that I may walk in them, Lord. I will 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 seek you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. Because I know that I'm only found in you, Lord. I'm only found in you, Lord. That is our heart cry, Lord. That is our heart cry, Lord. That is our heart cry, Lord. And Lord, your word says that if we pray according to your will, we know that you hear us. And if we know that you hear us, we know that we have that which we ask from you. And we want your will, Lord. We want your will. We do not even belong to us, Lord. We don't even belong to us. You paid so much for us. You paid so much. Oh, Jesus. Love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Teach us your ways, Lord, that we may walk, walk in it. Teach us your way, Lord, that we may walk in it. Help us to find ourselves, Lord. We are hidden in you. We are hidden in you. Psalm 86, verse 11, teach me, Lord. Teach me what you want me to do, and I will obey you faithfully, Lord. I will obey you faithfully, Lord. Teach me your ways to serve you with complete devotion, and I will. Psalm 25, verse 4, show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. I may walk in it. <laughs>